Ecology! Boy, what a fascinating topic, and one that I hold near and dear. But what is ecology? Ecology is defined as the relationship between organisms with each other and their environment. You may not think that this applies to you, but your very life, your very well-being, is dependent on other organisms. The environment that you're in, and likewise, many organisms depend on you. A healthy ecosystem with appropriate abiotic or non-living components such as nutrient availability, amounts of oxygen, and water is crucial for growing our own food. We require our homes and workplaces to be set at a particular temperature that is comfortable for our species to function. You even have thousands of species of microorganisms that reside inside of you because you are a warm, nutrient-rich ecosystem. Ecology is not only interesting, but important for the study of making our world more sustainable for now and into the future, for our species as well as many others on this planet. Ecology is a systemic study of how both the living and the non-living components of our world acquire energy and use that very energy. Also, how two species co-evolve to fulfill their niches and how the effects of introducing an invasive species can upset the cycle of interactions within an ecosystem. The main takeaway from all this is that you are part of this world. You do not transcend it, you need it, and you participate in it for better or for worse. So let's learn about these vast interrelationships and get started. Ecology can be broken down into four areas, and I'll use a prairie dog as an example. First is organismal ecology, which looks at a single organism and how its adaptations allow it to live successfully in a particular area. For example, the black-tailed prairie dogs are native to Canada and the United States, most specifically in the Great Plains region. Population ecology looks at how the interactions between members of the same species occur, such as competition for resources, male to female sex ratios, age class structures, and etc. Community ecology looks at the interactions between members of different species with each other and other biotic components. Here you see a prairie dog seeking shelter underneath a sagebrush, which are two separate species. But other aspects of community ecology would include things like competition, um, mutualism, predation, predator relationships. Then finally, there's ecosystem ecology, which is a community and its interaction to the abiotic or non-living components of their environment. So what you're seeing here is a prairie dog town, which is a series of holes in a vast field which houses these animals. And things such as temperature, precipitation, are examples of abiotic factors that affect what kinds of organisms live here. So let's get started with populations. Beginning with demography, which is a series of mathematical tools used to investigate changes in populations based on both biotic and abiotic factors. You may have heard of demography before, as it was originally designed for studying human populations. Of course, the main goal of population demography is counting individuals of a given species. As you can guess, it isn't always easy to get an exact figure. Therefore, ecologists employ various techniques to get an estimate. Population size refers to the number of individuals, characterized by the letter N. Population density refers to the number of individuals within a specific area or volume. Populations with high density are likely more stable due to a high degree of genetic diversity, allowing the species to survive any drastic changes to the environment. A low population density would mean that the species is spread out making it more difficult to find mates. There is a correlation between organism size and density with smaller organisms having a higher density. For example, in the Appalachians, we would expect salamanders to be more densely populated since they can't travel far and black bears to be more spread out due to their size and motility. There are many ways to do a population survey. One is a census, 
which is counting every individual you see in a given habitat. Of course, this is not always feasible due to the behavior of animals and observer bias, meaning that the actual count may not reflect what was observed due to a person simply being present. That is, because many animals flee in the presence of people. This is also really hard to do in a large habitat. For immobile or slow-moving organisms, such as plants and slugs, a quadrat can be used. Quadrats are square-shaped plots marked with tape, flags, poles, sticks, or string. Multiple quadrats are often placed in a given habitat, usually at a set distance from each other. This gives a sense of randomization, so that only organisms within the quadrat are counted. Quadrats are also varying sizes depending on the organism being studied. For salamanders or wildflowers, a one square meter plot is enough. If studying forest trees, you may want 100 square meters or more size of a plot. For mobile organisms, such as most vertebrates, mark and recapture methods are used. Personally, I studied eastern box turtles in graduate school, and part of my research was population demographics. I employed mark and recapture because, surprisingly enough, these turtles are a little bit faster than you think, and box turtles have a range of about three football fields, so they really do get around. You start by going to a particular habitat to be studied and mark the animals. In the past, biologists would clip ears, notch turtle shells, and even clip off toes of certain animals. Now most biologists use less invasive techniques such as banding, tagging, or in my case, I painted the number on a turtle shell with fingernail polish. Although after a while, I simply took photos of all the turtles I found at each, as each turtle shell pattern is unique. After your initial marking, you will want to go back to the same habitat and mark new individuals while counting the previously marked individuals. This prevents one from counting the same individual twice. Hope you like math, as ecology uses this a lot. The mark recapture equation is pretty simple. N, which is the total number of population, is equal to the number marked at the first catch times the total number of the second catch divided by the number marked at the second catch. So if I found 20 turtles on the first day, and I go back a few days later and find 15 turtles with five already marked, the population size would be determined as 60. So this particular population has an estimated 60 turtles living there. However, this is just an estimate as limitations to mark recapture is that some animals can learn to avoid capture a second time, making the numbers seem higher than they really are. Also, if food is used to entrap them, some species might willingly be captured. Populations are also measured by how distributed they are, called species distribution. Species distribution patterns are useful at determining if patterns exist, such as social behavior, or whether soil types are better in certain locations, or if a plant puts off specific chemicals to deter growth of other plants. Uh, this is called allelopathy, by the way. The three main distribution patterns are uniform, which is evenly spaced, random, which has no specific pattern, and clumped, where members of the population are clustered together. Uniform distributions are seen in animals that develop territories, such as penguins or in plants that perform allelopathy. This is seen in sagebrushes, in deserts, and dry grasslands. Random distributions can be seen in solitary animals, such as tigers, or in wind-dispersed plants like dandelions and grasses, which can have seeds land based on where the wind blows. Clumped distributions are seen in animals that group together or plants that drop their seeds below the parent plant. While population size and density are useful, they act as a snapshot of a given point in time. Demography helps to study the changes that occur in a population over a period of time. Examples of demographic data include birth rates, death rates, age class structures, life expectancies, and sex ratios. If a population has a low birth rate, it may be due to having fewer reproductive individuals in a population or having more males to females in a population. If a population has a higher death rate, it may be due to competition between members or a disease that has been inflicted upon the population. If birth and death rates are the same, population size remains stable. If birth rates exceed death rates, Populations increase in size and do the opposite if death rates exceed birth rates. Population ecologists use survivorship curves, a graph of the number of individuals surviving at each age interval over time. 
There are three types of curves. A type 1 curve, seen in humans and other primates, show the pattern of younger and middle-aged members surviving and death happening to mostly older adults. Due to having fewer offspring and more parental care, humans and other primates are longer lived. A type 2 curve, seen in birds, displays a pattern in which death happens evenly at all levels of life. Like type 1 organisms, they have fewer offspring and more parental care. A type 3 curve, seen in many invertebrates, fish, and trees, displays a pattern in which death happens mostly to younger members with fewer yet long-lived older members dying off. The trade-off for type 3 curves is high younger mortality rate by having lots of offspring while providing little to no parental care. In our next video, we will review life histories and study the major population growth patterns.